Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. I'd like first to congratulate the conveners of this conference. Uh, I think I can call them a diverse collection of bodies, uh, led by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office through the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, Chatham House, the Commonwealth, the British branch of the International Law Association, King's College London, and the universities of Nottingham and Oxford. Um, this is an important and timely initiative. We all have to engage with public international law these days, and you have a rich and varied diet of subjects to discuss and a dazzling array of speakers uh, to discuss them, and this will bring it all home to us. Times have changed so much since I was a law student in the University of Cambridge in the 1960s. Then public international law was seen as the law of nation states, regulating their relationships between one another in war and peace, but not conferring domestically or even internationally enforceable legal rights on individuals or businesses. I have to confess that I found it all rather dull. <laughs> and I gave it up for Roman law in my second year. But even then, that wasn't really a true picture of public international law. There were, of course, numerous treaties relating to international traffic and trade, which governed the contractual arrangements between, for example, airlines and their passengers. There were various Hague conventions and other treaties governing the relationship between the courts of different member states in the conduct of civil and family business. In the common law dualist tradition, of course, these treaties didn't change the law of the United Kingdom unless and until Parliament had legislated to do so, but of course it did. But there was a growing body of international human rights law, perhaps the most prominent being the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees of 1951. This imposed obligations upon member states towards individuals, but these were not necessarily translated into rights enforceable in UK law until much later. And its original scope was so much narrower, being aimed at the aftermath of the Second World War until the 1967 protocol broadened it. Now, of course, our courts are full of cases brought by individuals claiming rights under the convention. Only last year, for example, the Supreme Court had a fascinating case about refugees who had been rescued from the Mediterranean by the RAF and taken to the sovereign base areas on Cyprus. They were strenuously resisting all attempts by the British government to get them to relocate to the Republic of Cyprus. So were the sovereign base areas still covered by the convention, which had been extended to Cyprus before the independence of the Republic? And if they were still covered, did the convention give the refugees the right to be admitted to the United Kingdom? Really fascinating questions of international law. And of course, one problem with the refugee convention is that there is no supranational body to give a wholly authoritative ruling on its proper interpretation. So discrepancies between member states are bound to arise. Although in the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, when dealing with international law questions and the interpretation of treaties, we do try uh, and look and see what other jurisdictions are doing uh, and avoid discrepancies if we possibly can. And since then, of course, the collection of UN human rights treaties has grown and grown. The Covenants on Civil and Political Rights, on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and Discrimination Against Women, on the Rights of the Child and of Disabled People. Most of these have not been incorporated into UK law, although specific obligations in them, such as compensation for miscarriages of justice, have been. But they can creep into our law through the European Convention on Human Rights, because the European Court of Human Rights will try to interpret the rights guaranteed in the Convention consistently with international human rights law generally. So in that way, for example, the... Uh, primacy of the best interests of the child uh, creep into certain of the convention rights um, because Strasbourg puts it there. And of course the European convention rights are rights in UK law. Sometimes of course, instead of giving people rights, we are obliged by treaty to create or expand the reach of domestic criminal law. The UN Convention Against the Torture of 1984 obliged us to assume jurisdiction to punish torture committed by, quote, a public official or other person acting in an official capacity anywhere in the world. But what does this mean? 
does it extend to the wife of the leader of an insurgent group engaged in armed insurrection against the government of the country? If so, what degree of control must that group have over the country or parts of it? And these questions are raised by the current prosecution of Agnes Taylor, the wife of Charles Taylor during the rebellion in the early 1990s. This is just, I've just mentioned two of the cases raising questions of public international law that have recently come before the Supreme Court. So can I give a plug? To, you will find amongst the advertising in your uh, uh, bags, uh, this small document, which is not advertising. Uh, it is an account of 10 of the cases raising general questions of public international law that have come before the Supreme Court in its first 10 years. We look forward to welcoming some of you to the Supreme Court later on today, but even if you're not coming there, can I commend this booklet to you?